Amen. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 14, reading through verse 25, the King James text today reads, Romans 7, I should say, verses 14 through 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, listen saints, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is the Apostle Paul writing, the man who wrote the majority of the New Testament. And he's saying something that if he said it in a lot of churches today, he'd get excommunicated. Oh no, you don't confess you have sin in you. Of course you do. As long as you're on planet Earth, as long as you're subject to gravity, you have sin. But Paul said, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, saying, I have the desire, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So I have the desire to do the right things, but trying to figure out how to do the right things, I have a problem with. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil, listen to the words he uses, the evil which I would not, that I do. Paul, don't you know, according to First Baptist Church, you can't be a Christian and expect to go to heaven and do evil. Oh, yes, you can. Thank God for grace when you understand grace. Uh -huh. Verse 20. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. You wonder why the word of God has said that believers says God's people don't sin. Line upon line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little. There's a reason why it says that. Does it say that because God's people don't sin? No, because John said, if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. Paul said, the evil that I would not, I do. Right. Right? Right. But listen to what Paul said. He said, now if I do that, I would not. He said, if I do the things that I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So I've got news for you. The believer is looked at differently by God. The unbeliever God sees as doing these things. Oh, hallelujah. But the believer he sees as sin in them doing these things. Oh, my goodness. It's no longer I that do them. <laughs> Woo! So God looks at my situation different because of my faith. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Let's finish before I get to preaching. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members. Listen. Warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, or in my body. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus. 
Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh the law of sin. I'm going to tell you something. You get out and you preach this and a church of God church. You preach this in the Assembly of God church. You preach this in the UPC. You preach this in First Baptist. You preach this in the Christian Missionary Alliance. And honey, they're going to excommunicate you, disfellowship you, throw you out unceremoniously. But this is the truth of God's Word. That's what the, it's what the Scripture says. That's why People don't understand grace and they don't understand how grace works for the believer, how faith sanctifies us, purifies us, allows us to stand holy before God. Yes. Because our faith, listen to me, old children, our faith separates our sin from us. So that God does not see us doing this thing. But rather he sees the sin in us doing this thing. As though the sin in us were an entirely different entity. They were an entirely different purpose. Oh, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So God condemns the act of sin. But, thank God, because of grace, He doesn't condemn the sinner. Hallelujah. Why? Because of their faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, then I won't preach a little. Amen. Master, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost. You are the Lord of glory. You are the great I am. Master, today I need the anointing, the touch of the Holy Ghost. That I might deliver unto the people of God the Word of God, which is able to save, which is able to deliver, which is able to set the captive free, which is able to heal sick bodies, which is able today to break the bondage of the enemy. Lord, deliver today from the false spirit of guilt and condemnation and allow believers to step in to the liberty of the Holy Ghost, to step into the rest which you have promised to believers through right understanding of your truth. Help me to deliver this message, O oh God, today in a manner that brings honor and glory to your name. And on every ear that hears that they too, Lord, might be ready, willing, able to receive the word of God. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' lovely, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to talk to us today for a little while on the topic breaking free of carnal thinking breaking free of carnal thinking the apostle paul in romans chapter 7 articulates the difficulty the struggle that a believer has because listen to me because of their human form the body is sinful flesh. The body, the human body and the human mind are subject to sin so long as they are subject to gravity. And the, Paul begins to articulate in Romans chapter 7, 14 to 25, the great that exists in the life of a believer. We know the right thing to do so often. We know how to act. We know how to talk. We know how to behave. We know how to do that which is right. And yet somehow or another we constantly find ourselves 
ourselves to be faulting to wrong behavior and wrong conduct and wrong language and wrong statements. Paul said this trouble exists because my flesh is still part of my life right now. And as long as I am subject to the flesh, as long as my flesh plays a role in my life and in my living, then there are going to be ungodly things that I'm going to do. There are going to be unholy things. There are going to be evil things. There are going to be wicked things that will come out of my mouth. but after the spirit. I love people who want to say you can't be gay and be a Christian. You can't be this and be a Christian. You can't do that and be a Christian. You're foolish. Your understanding of God's word is at best minimal. You don't get it. I got news for you. You don't get it. You don't understand grace. You don't understand faith. You may use the words. You may sing the songs. You may have the vocabulary down. But honey, don't use the words. You don't even know what they mean. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I'm going to tell you something. you got to take the whole of the message, not the part. You've got to take the whole. That is why God said through the Old Testament prophet, line upon line, precept upon precept, here on the old there on the old. Paul uh, all but, but uh, vocalized those same words when he said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You cannot just pull a scripture out of context. And I don't mean out of context of the chapter it's in or the book that it's in. No, 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 no. Out of the context of the whole. You can't take it out of the context of... See, that's why I can't debate with anybody about our doctrine. That's why I don't waste my time trying to debate with anybody. Because I know they're approaching this thing from a bits and pieces viewpoint. They pull this piece out. Well, this here says this. And that here says this. Honey, if you want to give me the bits and pieces, I got news for you. I guarantee you I can pull something out of there that will condemn you to hell for all of eternity. I'm as sure of it as, my, as I know my name. Yes. I'm as sure of it as I know my name. Bits and pieces would condemn everybody. Nobody would be right. saved. Heaven would be empty the day after the rapture. If you're going to take this thing by bits and pieces, if you're idiot enough to think that you're saved and you're ready for heaven and you're going to make it, bless God, and it's because you follow enough of the rules and you follow enough of the law. Oh, honey, please. How foolish. No, every believer does the best they can. Mm -hmm. Within, listen to me, within the context of who they are. Yes, yes. 
Because every believer comes to the ball game with different issues. I'm going to tell you, there's some people who, who grew up in an environment and their learned behaviors, and they ain't never going to unlearn it. And if you're going to stand there and tell people they're going to hell because they were not, uh, they were not able to unlearn the behavior they learned growing up, you're a liar from the pit of hell, and you know nothing about the Word of God. And then other people have issues in their lives, brother, that they have never made a choice concerning. You know what I'm talking about. They didn't choose it, but boy, it was something that they had to wrestle with, something they had to reckon with, right. something they struggled against. How many of us prayed and yeah. fasted and spent years suppressing, going through depression, going yes. through loneliness, yes. going through darkness, yes. going through uh, suicidal thoughts and suicidal yes. experiences, all because somebody convinced us that salvation, listen to me, children, is contingent upon us. Yes. It is contingent upon our ability to meet some standard. You are a liar from the pit of hell. Salvation has never been on me. Salvation has never required that I be something I cannot be, that I do something I cannot do. No, salvation has always been on him. Always been on him. Always been on him. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of glory. And all he says is, look to me. Like the serpent in the wilderness that Moses was told to design and wrap around the pole. Hallelujah. And oh, he might be kind Oh, I just want to have a Holy Ghost Jubilee for a minute. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you. The Lord said, wrap that serpent, the serpent. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That serpent is the cause of your trouble. That serpent is the cause of your pain. That serpent is your curse. I have set the serpents in the midst of you. And they're stinging you. They're biting you. They're killing you. They're taking your life. He said, well, I got news for you. That serpent simply represents sin. My God. Oh my God. He said, now you wrap that serpent around the pole and you raise that pole up in the middle of the camp and everybody that's been stuck, everybody that's been bit, everybody that's been affected by the serpent, all they have to do is look to that pole with the serpent wrapped around me in the middle of the camp and they will live. Hallelujah. I got news for you, children. Every believer every day gets stumped by the pains of sin. Every believer on this planet every day experiences the bite of the serpent. But if we'll look to the cross, oh, hallelujah, it is all. Look to the cross and live. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. In Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, the apostle Paul writes, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Now listen. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I'm talking today about breaking free of carnal thinking. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity 
against God. It is the enemy of God, the carnal mind. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. He said not only is the natural mind, the carnal mind, not subject to the law of God, he said, but the reality is, it's impossible for it to be. So it can't be done. You cannot make a carnal mind subject to the law of God. So what does that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells me. It tells me we need to break free of carnal thinking. He said, so then they that are in the flesh, or they that are of a carnal mind, cannot please God. Paul said in our primary text today, Romans 7, verse 23, but I see another law. What is a law? A law is immutable, unchanging facts and principles. We think of law, when we read that word, Paul said, for I see a law. We look at that in terms of a law like rules and regulations. That's not what Paul's saying. He, no, no. He's talking about law in the same sense that we refer to the law of gravity. See? The law of gravity. What is the law of gravity? The law of gravity is an immutable fact. It is a scientific fact. No matter what you do or how you try to do it, you cannot defy gravity. Amen? No, because gravity does what gravity does, and that's all there is to it. Well, when Paul said, uh, but I see another law in my members war against the law of my mind, he said, there are immutable facts, there are immutable truths related to our human existence. He said, no matter how you want to get away from them, honey, you can't because they're immutable, they're unchanging, they're fact. And they war against the law of my mind. Yeah, there are things in my mind. I've made up my mind to want to live for God. I've made up my mind to want to do right. I've made up my mind to want to live holy. I've made up my mind to want to be a testimony. I've made up my mind to want to act right, do right, talk right, live right. He said, but you've got this set of laws in your members, in your body. What? against that law in your mind. My Lord have mercy. In Philippians 2, if I'm not trying to move fast today, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. Nobody made Jesus. Nobody made the man Jesus. Quote unquote, the Father did not create the Son. No, 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 no. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, meaning Jehovah Savior, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth. Oh, hallelujah, the angels will bow, humanity will bow, and things under the earth, even the demons will bow. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's not about one person uh, being declared to be Lord and that thus then glorifying somebody else. That's not Jesus the Son 
be called Lord. And thus glorify, quote, the Father. No, no, no. The Father is glorified when people, humanity, the world, demons, humanity, angels, all bow down and acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Because anybody who understands the message of this book knows Oh, child, let me tell you a little secret. You don't call nobody Lord but God, and you don't call nobody God but Lord. Oh, here we go, it's for the Lord. Our God is one Lord. Hallelujah. So when we declare Jesus Christ to be Lord, we are declaring Him to be God. And when we declare Him to be God, we are glorifying God the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Because we're recognizing the great redemptive plan that he put into motion to bring salvation to a lost humanity. Oh, glory to the name of Jesus. But let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, honey, how do we break free of carnal thinking? Well, to break free of carnal thinking, you've got to think, listen to me, children, you've got to think in terms of the Word of God. You've got to think in terms of the will of God. Said so he was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to submit himself and surrender himself even to death. And not just, you know, any old death. But one of the most horrendous and painful and torturous deaths that in the history of humanity has ever been visited upon the human form. Said he was willing to do all that. He was willing to set aside his divinity so that he could carry out this divine act of grace and this divine act of love. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Said, and this is how you need to think. No matter how big, big shot you think you are, you need to be willing to set that aside and offer yourself. The Word of God said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I told Claude, my friend in New York City, that has been supportive of my ministry and supportive of this work for many, many years now. I told him the other day, I said, you know, Claude, I'm going to tell you a little secret. A lot of people with my health issues, a lot of people with my struggles were to quit. They had retired. They said, I can't do it. It's too much. I mean, I get tired these days just trying to walk through a grocery store. And literally, and I have, and if I don't use one of them little electric carts, i got to go home and go to sleep for three or four hours because I walk through Kroger. That's how quickly my body becomes weary. But you see, I can't quit. God called me. Brother Tatlock, many years ago when I first came out and was out of church, Brother Tatlock was the independent Jesus name preacher who dedicated me as a baby and he happened to come by my grandparents' house. And of course he would do it the first year that I came out. And let me tell you, my family revered Brother Babcock, not Brother Babcock, Brother uh, Tatlock. My family revered him. He was such a marvelous man of God. So, <laughs> Such a man of faith. He walked in the power of God like few people you've ever seen in your life. That man saw miracles every day of his life. People healed and delivered. He fell off the roof of the building, the church building he's working on. Somebody called the ambulance and the ambulance came. He was knocked out for quite a while. They finally brought him back to consciousness. And he looked up and he said, well, who are you? And they said, we're, we're the uh, paramedics and we're going to take you to the hospital. He said, no, you're not. He said, I'm building a church. He said, if my God I serve can't heal me, I'll never serve him another day of my life. He got up, walked up the ladder, went right back on the roof and started working. That was Brother Tatlock. Brother Tatlock didn't play games. Word of God said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a 
a living sacrifice. Why do I keep going? Why do I keep doing what God's called me to do? Because I made a commitment many years ago that my body was a living sacrifice. And therefore, if I have to suffer in my body while still trying to do the work of God, then I'm going to suffer in my body. Oh my God, but I'm going to keep doing the work of God. My body belongs to God. He didn't say, so long as it's easy, do it. No, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Every Sunday I get up in the pulpit and I'm offering the Lord a living sacrifice that I pray is holy and acceptable in His sight. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let this mind be in you. Humility is a huge part. A huge part of walking free of carnal thinking. But there's so much pride in the church world today. So many Christians think so highly of themselves. They think themselves to be sin free. It is. I'm just saying it. I don't mince words. I don't play. You're an idiot. You think you're living sin free. You're an idiot. Or you can't be gay and be a Christian. Let me tell you something, my friend. Every day of my life, every day of my life, there are things I do and don't do. There are decisions I make every day of my life, just like you, that are based on the Word of God. There are I've been hurt, I've been bruised, I've been wounded, I've been accused, I've been offended by people, and yet I have responded to them in the manner prescribed by the Word of God. Why? Because that's what the Word of God said I'm supposed to do. So we've got a news story. There are millions of Christian LGBT people who every day of their lives live their lives exactly the same way you do. We do the best we can. We do the best we can. We try everything in our power to do everything we can as right as we can in the moment. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Thank nothing you're doing, we're not doing. Not a thing in the world you're doing. Oh, but, you know, you can't be who you are. Well, i got news for you, my friend. If you're divorced or married, the Word of God said you're an adulterer. Period. End of the story. You can try to twist Scripture. You can try to twist it and turn it every which way you want to turn it. But according to the Word of God, if you are divorced or married, look up the definition. Go to Strong's Concordance. Look up the word fornication as found uh, in the book of Acts when the church, the early church fathers, the apostles were giving direction to the early church that it was taken from fornication, from things strangled, uh, from meat offered to idols, so on and so forth. Go ahead and look that word fornication up in the original Greek. And let me tell you a little secret. Part of the definition of that word is having sexual intercourse with a divorced person. Period. There are no exceptions. Thinking that when you remarry, well, at least it's heterosexual. So God just acts like you were never married before. No, honey, listen, you are twisting the word of God so bad it's not even funny. Am I trying to condemn people who are divorced or married? No, but I'm trying to wake them up. Not trying to condemn them, but I'm trying to shake them loose a little bit and make them realize, sweetheart, you're in the same identical boat I am. The same boat. You're not even in a different day. You're in the same boat. Paul said, you got the nerve to sit there and condemn somebody. He said, well, you're doing the same thing. Got news for you. You're in the same identical boat I am. You are living within what you call a sexual sin. That's right. And you're living in it. You're walking in it. Oh, but I've repented of my divorce. No, you didn't. If you repented of your divorce, you'd go back to your spouse and remarry. Because repentance is not, gee, Lord, I'm sorry I did that stupid thing, but now I'm going to act like I never did it, and I'm just going to do something different. No, that's not how repentance works. 
No, repentance is followed by restitution. You make it right. Don't tell me you, you repented of your divorce. No, you didn't. You told God you were sorry you married the old Pat to begin with. That's what you did. But you didn't repent of the divorce. Oh, I want to tell you, I'm tired of people playing games. I'm tired of people condemning others and twisting scripture and perverting scripture so they can condemn somebody else. And all the while, they are walking themselves in sin. My Lord, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, hallelujah, look to the cross and live. The author and finisher of our faith. Listen. Who for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross. Despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. God news for you. A throne is a piece of furniture. It's not a person. He is set down at the right hand of the throne. One day, that same Jesus don't get on that throne, honey. And that throne will be called that day, according to the book of Revelation, the throne of God and of the Lamb. The same throne. He's not going to sit in the throne beside the Father. No, no, no. He's going to sit in the throne as the Father. And then one singular throne will be called the throne of God, even in of the Lamb. Because God and the Lamb are one. Oh, how I can preach me some oneness today. Abraham looked at his son, Isaac. Isaac said, Daddy, you got the wood, you got the fire, you got everything to offer a sacrifice for where's the Lamb? Oh, hallelujah. Abraham said, oh, Isaac. <laughs> he said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. What he was saying was not, God himself will provide a sacrifice. No, that's not what he said. He said, God will provide himself. He said, God will come down from heaven as a lamb and get all that wood before he's going to make you, me sacrifice you. How do I know? Because he made an everlasting covenant with me. And he said, through Isaac shall all the nations of the world be blessed. So there ain't no way in the world God expects me to follow through and kill you. There is no way in the world. God will sooner come down from heaven and eat on a shandobo and get on that altar before he'll ever ask me to harm hair on your head. Hallelujah. Think about it. Why? Because God's word is true. He is not a man that he should lie. He made a covenant with Abraham and that covenant specified through Isaac. God named Isaac. So when Abraham answered Isaac, he said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Meaning, God will come down with me. That was a prophetic word. Because God was going to come down and get on the altar. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. But the word of God said, looking unto Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God until all things are finished. Read the book of Revelation. I'm going to be teaching on it pretty quick. We're going to do a study in the next few weeks, God willing, on the book of Revelation. Honey, then it'll set you on fire. It's so exciting. People are afraid of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, one of the most exciting books you ever read in your life because it tells you who Jesus is. That's right. It reveals Jesus as God, That's right. as the Creator, as the Almighty. Hallelujah. Oh, children, listen. 
sit down at the right hand of the throne of God for the time being. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint. Listen, in your minds. Breaking free of carnal thinking. What does that entail? Well, I'm going to tell you what it entails. It entails being able to see the end result and focus on it so that everything, oh, I'm preaching to the preacher right now. I'm preaching to the preacher. So that everything that happens in the process of getting to the destination, you endure. You put up with it. Doesn't mean you like it. Said he despised the shame. Oh, I'm going to tell you, God's given me a vision for what he wants to do. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing until I get to where I'm trying to go. Hallelujah. I'm going to keep working on that vision. Like Tammy Faye used to say, I'm standing up on the wall. I'm not coming down. Satan, get behind me. I'm giving you no ground. I'm going to do what God has told me till I hear the victory sound. I'm standing up on the wall. I'm not coming down. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep doing. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep preaching until I finally reach that vision. I'm going to endure all the crapola that I have to endure in the meantime. Doesn't mean I won't like it. Doesn't mean I have to like it. Even Jesus didn't like what he had to go through. Said, who for the joy? In other words, he was focused on the end. He was focused on the final result. And the final result was something he knew was going to make him happy. But that didn't mean he enjoyed the process of getting there. So don't think, believer, you have to enjoy the place you're at right now. You don't have to enjoy all the children. Don't let it beat you. Don't let it win. Don't let it put you into submission. Don't let it cause you to quit. Hallelujah. No. Endure it. Endure, Paul said. Hardness as a good soldier. Many believers today are being groomed by false prophets and false teachers to look upon and see the world as their oyster. They're told that the Lord Jesus Christ came so that we could have the best possible life. That's a lie. All of their focus and all of their energies are spent pointing to issues of this life. Whether it be politics, culture wars, or groups of people with whom they disagree. They have abandoned the precepts of, listen, uniqueness, light, and separation taught by the Lord and His holy apostles. If you understand the concepts of, listen, if you understand the concepts of uniqueness, light, and separation as taught by the Lord and by the apostles, then you'll understand how to break free of karma thinking, being focused on this world, being focused on this life, being focused on what's happening in the natural world. In Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, listen, and with all thy mind. You gotta break free of carnal thinking. Oh, you can't love the Lord with partial mind. Peace your mind with a little bit of your mind. Oh, no, 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 no. With all your mind. That means you got to change the whole way you see things. You got to change everything. You got to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He was so focused on the plan. He was so focused on the will of God 
that he was willing to put up with whatever he had to put up with. Oh, we got people that they, they can't focus on the plan of God. They can't focus on the will of God. No, because we can't have a Democrat in the White House. We can't have this. We can't have that. Oh, no, we can't have these things, honey. Yes, you can. And all you have to do is endure them. Because your mind should be elsewhere. You should be thinking about heavenly things, not earthly things. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a weight of the sea. Driven with the wind and tossed. Mm. You better have your mind made up. You better know when you're asking God for something, you better be asking fully believing He's going to get it. Because if you're flopping around, maybe He will, maybe He won't. James, the brother of Jesus, said, Don't expect to get nothing. Because people whose minds flop around like a wave of the sea said, uh, uh, you don't get nothing. That's not how this thing works. You got to have a mind made up. Oh, hallelujah. Again, I go to that old song. I got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. <laughs> Though I walk through the lonesome valley. Though I drink from a bitter cup. When the devil comes to knocking, show me an easy way. I look him right square in the eye, and this is what I say. I got my foot on the rock, and my mind's made up. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. But let him ask in faith, nothing will he drink. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Listen, verse 7, James 1. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man, a man that can't make up his mind to believe God. Brother Tatlock got up after falling off the roof of a building God up and said, I'm not my God, if my God can't heal me, I won't serve him. Got on the ladder, called right back because he had a made up mind. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe what the Word of God said. Period. End of the story. That's it. And that's how that man lived, let me tell you. Galatians 6 and 3 For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself, breaking free, free of a carnal mind. Breaking free of a carnal mind. I'm going to tell you what breaking free of a carnal mind, getting into a spiritual mind. You can look at yourself honestly. And I'm going to tell you, if you can look at yourself honestly, you'll never look down on anybody else again. The minute you start looking at yourself honestly, you will never sit in judgment of another person so long as you live. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Romans 12, 1 through 3, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you heard me say this, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed out by the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man 
the measure of faith. What does Paul say? He's saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, humble yourself. Humble yourself. I told you, humility. You don't hear preachers preach humility anymore. I preach it almost every Sunday. Why? Because it is such an important part of being a Christian. It is such an important part of walking in a spiritual mindset and breaking free of carnal thinking. No, you got to humble yourself. You've got to be able to look at yourself honestly. You've got to be able to look. Listen, I look at other Christians. I, I've said it so many times I get tired of saying it. But brother and sister Gilman, brother and sister King, and I, uh, I can name people I grew up in church with. I can name pastors that I've had and uh, mentors like Brother Gold. Honey, I don't see myself as even being in the same room as those people as far as the way he lived for God. I wish, I wish I had Brother Gilman's quiet spirit. I wish I had that humble, quiet nature that he has. That's not who I am. That's not how I grew up. That's not who I am. Bless God, Amy and Clint in uh, uh, Kansas who have been with our church for many, many, over a decade now. Uh, when I went to see them the last time, a couple months ago, to baptize Brady in the water. Hi, Brady. And uh, Camille. Camille, I forgot to say hello to y'all earlier. I'm sorry. Um, when I went to baptize Brady in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, you know, I was telling uh, uh, Clint and Amy, I said, honestly, you know, I, uh, there are people I know who have lived this thing so much better than I ever could. And they said, yeah, but Pastor, you're you. You're, you know, you're different. You're, you, you just have your own way. You have your own stuff. I said, yeah, but you know, still, I, I don't care how you slice it, brother, go. Brother and sister, you we're about this far from walking on water as far as that's concerned. The humility, the quietness of their spirit, the control, the self-control they had, you know. I don't have those things like they do. But you know what? The Word of God said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. We're supposed to esteem others, the Scripture tells us, above ourselves. You've got to be able to look at others and recognize, you know what? They do this better than I do. They live this better than I do. But you know, when you're able to look at others and you're able to esteem them more highly than yourself, do you know what you've just created for yourself? A role model. As long as you think, well, I'm as good as brother and sister Gil are, I'm as good as these people are. I'm as good as those people are. As long as you've got that foolishness running around in your head, you don't have any role models. You don't have anybody setting an example. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. For your destination, where you'd like to go, where you'd like to be. But see, I do have role models. I do have people. Brother Go, Sister Go, Brother Tatlock, Sister Tatlock. So many I could name. Brother and Sister King, you know, the King brothers in the church. The church I grew up in, we had two brothers named King, Harold and um, Richard King. And I grew up with those men, and those men, by God Almighty, were wonderful Christian men. They had, oh my God, they had the most sweet spirit about them you ever wanted to see in your life. And they went into hospitals to visit and pray for people, and God gave them miracles. God delivered my grandfather from death. The doctor told my grandmother to go home and find a suit to bury my grandfather in. And the King brothers came into that hospital, and they anointed my grandfather with oil and prayed for him, and God gave him a miracle. 
Oh, I want to tell you folks, there's a lot of people that I esteem highly. There are a lot of people I look at that I feel like do this thing so much better than I do. But you know what? Because I recognize that, I'm able to recognize that there are areas in my life I need to work on. There are things I need to work toward. I have some role models. So oh, hallelujah. Isn't that the truth today? Praise God. So Paul said, For I say to the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Well, tell you, there's more trouble caused in churches every day. I've been preaching for 40 years, and I'm going to tell you right now, you let something back come into the church, and they've got a mindset, well, I'm as good as the pastor. I know as much as the pastor knows. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I've been in a lot of churches in my day, even after I've been preaching and pastoring. When I'm in a church, I humble myself before the man of God. I'm not there to teach him. I'm there to learn from him. I'm not there to give him something. I'm there to get something from him. This baloney of people coming into churches. We have people, we've had people right here in Nashville since we've been here that have come in and sit through a service. And the whole service, I felt that demon being shot at me. I know as much as you do. I know I'm as good as you are. And you know what? They didn't come back, bless God. No, nope, because they're so perfect and everybody else is so lacking. Yeah, you think I don't know? I know good well. I knew. I told Tommy, I said, they won't be back. Trust me, they won't be back. I, honey, I've been at this thing too long. And I can see and feel that proud spirit just oozing out of their pore. That self-righteous, legalistic spirit. I don't want that mess coming out of me. I don't want that mess. My Lord, Brother uh, uh, Carver, when I did my internship in the Church of God years ago, I need to shut up, so I need to hurry up here. When I did my internship in the Church of God many years ago, the pastor I was going to do my internship under, I hadn't met him, and I, I didn't know him, and I had just gone back to Connecticut from Texas, and I was, you know, straight holiness, hallelujah, glory to God, you know, women don't cut their hair, and they don't wear children, and they don't wear makeup, and we men cut our hair short, and we don't wear children, and we don't wear jeans, and we don't wear sneakers. That's how straight I was, that's how straight I was. We don't wear a wedding band, glory to God. When I married Stacy, we didn't even exchange wedding bands. We exchanged Bibles. Because we don't wear a wedding bands. Hallelujah. We're too holy for wedding bands. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And uh, so I invited Brother Carver to come and meet me. And he came and met me and we talked. And of course I told him, you know, well, bless God, brother, I'm old school. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I believe in hopes. I believe in Buckingham. I, I laid it off. What I didn't know was that Brother Carver up in New England was way more liberal than the churches in the South. And he wasn't into all the rules and regulations and all that. And he didn't really say anything about it to me right then. But Brother Carver told me later, he said, you know, he said, Chuck, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, after I met you that day, he said, I was going out to my car and I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want that man in my church. I don't want that kid in my church. I don't blame him. I honestly don't blame him. He said, but you know what the Holy Ghost said to me? He said, the Holy Ghost literally rebuked me and said to me, don't you touch him. He is mine. That's what the pastor brother uh, Douglas Carver told me. He said, Chuck, after the first day I met you, I didn't want you in my church. And when I told the Lord I didn't want you in my church, he said, the Holy Ghost rebuked me and said, that boy is mine. I've got a calling on his life. Don't you dare speak against him. And then Brother Carver told me a while later after I served 
as an intern in his church and all. And he told me, he said, you know, Chuck, when I first met you, I thought you were going to be one of those self-righteous, you know, holier than thou uh, people who was going to be a judge to everybody and condemn everybody and criticize everybody in the church. He said, but you know what? He said, you came into our church where women cut their hair, where ladies come into church wearing pants, where, you know, they wear jewelry, they wear makeup. And all. He said, and all I ever saw you do was love everybody. He said, I never one time heard you speak a word against one person in that church. He said, you loved them. You treated them like they were a believer. You didn't even act like they weren't what they ought to be. Or they were, no, they were just in a different place spiritually. Did I believe differently than they did? Sure did. But you know what? We all grow. We all mature. We're all in a place today. We're not going to be tomorrow. That is if we're growing. Amen. So therefore, I just looked at them like, okay, well, this is where they're at right now. So I, why would I hate them? Why would I despise them? Why would I dislike them? Why would I mistreat them? Just because this is where they're at right now. You follow what I'm saying? And I never one time contradicted Brother Carter in the teaching. I said, no, sir, he's the pastor of this church. They'll answer to God for what he preaches here. It's not my job to come in here and tear something up. It's not my job to come in here and cold fix stuff. Oh, that's not how it works. He's the pastor. My Bible says, submit yourselves unto those that are in authority over you in the Lord. And I tell the truth. And I got news for you. Whether the pastor I was under was more liberal than I was or was more strict than I was, didn't matter. I submit myself to them because that's breaking free of carnal thinking. That's how you walk with the spiritual life. And you know what? Every pastor I've ever been under, I've loved, I've admired, I've benefited from. Every one of them. They could be, back then, you know, some of them were so much more liberal than I was, you know. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. They still had so much to offer me. They still had so much that they were able to give me and teach me and help me with. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Well, I'm going to tell you, when you learn to break free of carnal thinking, when you learn to walk in a spiritual mindset, you look at everything different. Well, I'll tell you, the reason Donald Trump is so popular in the evangelical community today is very simple, very simple, very simple. Because you got a bunch of carnal jackasses in the church who were so carnal in their thinking. They don't know how to think spiritually. They wouldn't know how to think spiritually. If you forced them into a room and gave them lessons, they wouldn't know how to think spiritually. They are so carnally minded. But what does the word of God say? For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. You know why these people are constantly running around like chickens with their head chopped off, screaming and hollering, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know why they're always afraid? You know why they're always terrified? Because they're carnal. I got a fish, so I'm going to have to jump ahead in my notes today. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You get a spiritual mind. I'm going to tell you, say, everybody around you going to know you got a spiritual mind. You know why? Because a spiritual mind and a carnal mind are about as opposite one another as light and dark. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> a city that is set on the hill cannot be hit. Cannot be hit. Cannot be hit. Can 
cannot be hit. It's impossible. You get a spiritual mind, honey. You, you, people around you don't know you got a spiritual mind. They're going to look at you like you're a big one. Why isn't that guy ever afraid? Why isn't that guy ever terrified? Why isn't that guy running around like Kenny Penny? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. We need Trump in the White House because the sky is falling. We need this because abortion is legal. And we don't believe in abortion. And blah, blah, blah. Uh, why are there people like that? Because they're coming. And the spiritually minded are the exact opposite. They're not moved by none of that. Couldn't care less. Couldn't, doesn't matter to me no kind of way. Doesn't matter to me, Democrat gets elected all this well. Republican gets elected all this well. You know, I love how they try to say things they don't really believe. Well, that's not no matter who gets elected. God's in control. Yeah, you believe that when your guy's in office. Oh. The minute the other guy gets in, you don't believe that anymore. Oh. All of a sudden, the devil running loose and he's controlling everything. <laughs> My Lord have mercy. Come on now. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on the hill cannot be hit. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. One of the unique aspects of a believer's life, listen to me children, is found in our perspective. We don't look at things in this life the same way unbelievers do. We're able to approach even the most difficult and trying of circumstances with faith and confidence in God. Romans 8, 28, we believe this. Listen to what Paul said. I love, I love the way Paul said it. He said, and we know he didn't say we think, we believe. He said, and we know. If you're not of a carnal mind, if you're of a spiritual mind, then you know this to be true. That all things work together for good to them that love God. What? All things? That don't include Clinton being present, it sure does. That don't include Obama being present, sure it does. That don't include Kamala being present, sure it does. Sure, it does. Uh, anybody with a spiritual mind knows, Paul said, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Yeah, but they're going to usher in the end of Christ. Hallelujah. That means the rapture is that much closer. I think that's right. Okay, all these, oh, oh. All these oh, big bad oh. Christians crack me up. Right. All these so-called Christians who are constantly working against the unveiling and the revelation of the end of Christ. Honey, the man of sin, the son of perdition, must go into the holy of holies and declare himself to be God before the rapture can take place. That's what Paul said. Therefore, come on, man of Christ, show up. Man, the sooner you can get here, the sooner I'm out of here. Hallelujah. But we got people, everything they do is based in fear. Everything they do is based in fear. Mega, the entire movement is based on fear. It's all about being afraid. Be afraid of immigrants. Be afraid of others. Be afraid of other races. Be afraid of other people. That's not a spiritual mind, my friend. That is not a godly perspective. That is not a spiritual. They know faith. Fear and faith cannot sit in the same throne. So if you're serving fear, then honey, there is no faith in your life. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We know that all things work together for good to them of God, to them who are called according to His purpose. A believer thinks differently. 
A believer looks at things differently. We are governed by a mind that is surrendered to the word and will of God. Listen, this is an area where we look at things differently or we're supposed to. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm going to tell you something. If you're a Christian and you've got a spiritual mind, that's how you look at things. I ain't worried about it. They're going to take my life. Take my life. I'm going to heaven. I'm ready. Got my ticket in my back pocket. I know where I'm going. I believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shut. I believe one day I'm going to look Jesus in the eye and he's going to say, well done, my child. Hallelujah. And if you believe it, then y'all live like you believe it. But we got a bunch of carnal Christians running around. Oh, the church is in a persecution week. Oh, the people are tired of prevail from me. Christians in America and live in our convictions and blah, 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 blah. everything they say is based on fear. Everything they say is based on fear. Jesus said, Don't be afraid of those that can kill the body. Worry about the one that can take your soul. That is the spiritual mind versus the carnal mind. You believe like the Lord said, you don't look like a fool to most people in this world because you ain't afraid of the guys who are threatening to take your life. You're not afraid of them. You're not worried about them. People don't think you're nuts. You're not nuts. You're just spiritually minded. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Luke chapter 12, to be spiritually minded, verses 19 through 31. And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. That is the spiritual mindset. You put the kingdom of God first and you're not worried about whether or not you're going to eat. You're not worried about whether or not you're going to be able to take care of your needs. And no, because you know God's in control and He knows what you need even before you ask Him. Job 121, this is a spiritual mind. And Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, honey, how many Christians in the world today live like that? That is the spiritual mind. No, things change. I don't have today what I had yesterday. Now I'm mad. Now I'm upset. Now I'm irritated. Tommy and I moved to Alabama. Let me tell you something. We left a gorgeous house in Dallas. We had a beautiful home that God blessed us with in Dallas. When we had to move to Alabama, we had to do things quickly. We had to make a lot of quick decisions. Uh, we didn't have the budget to buy a house that we had hoped we had. And we wound up having to settle for something that is far less, far, not a little bit, a lot less than what we had in Dallas. But you know what? The Lord gave, the Lord paved the way. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I got a house. I got a roof over my head. And it's not a terrible house. It's a nice house. Part, you know, I like Paul. Paul said, I've learned to be content whatsoever state I'm in. I can be happy in a hole. I can. I can be happy in a hole in the wall. Trust me. I know how to live there. <laughs> I can be, you know, I can be happy wherever God happens to set me. That is the spiritual mind. Carnal mind. We got all these people in the in the political world today griping and groaning and complaining. Oh, they've got uh, with inflation. I can't buy a house like I want to be able to buy a house. I can't do this and I can't do that. And, uh, uh, yeah, things will change. Things will turn around. That's how the economy works. It works in cycles. It's been like this since the beginning of time. Frank. Doesn't have jack squat to do with who's in the White House. The person in the White House simply oversees the economy. They don't cause it. Right. 
right. Yep, Dayton Lane. <laughs> Look at all these people. They're small. That's God. You know, they're upset. Why? Because they're of a carnal mind. They're not looking at things spiritually. In Psalm 37, verse 20, almost done. Psalm 37, 25. David, the psalmist wrote, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Oh, that's a spiritual mind. You know what? I ain't got nothing to worry about because God takes care of the righteous. God will take care of me. Amen. He'll take care of us. Lastly, today, Philippians 8, uh, 4, 8 through 13. This is so important, saints. That's why I had to share it even I'm running over time. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, true, not Donald Trump's bullcrap lies. I'm going to say it plain. Not his crap, which you know as well as anybody knows. It's a bunch of bunk and a bunch of foolishness. But whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. In other words, not griping and groaning and complaining. Whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I'm talking about breaking free of carnal thinking. This is spiritual thinking right here. Oh, you're not always filled with angst. You're not always filled with anger. You're not always looking at the negative. You're not always complaining. You're not always fighting fault in Joe Biden. You're not always looking for things you can brag about and groan about. No. If there's anything good about the man, that's what you look at. Oh my Lord, have mercy. If there's anything good about the man, that's what you look at. Because as Christians, we approach things from a very different perspective. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. The only way you're going to walk in life and have peace in this life is if you learn how to look at things from a spiritual perspective. And from a spiritual perspective, i got news for you. You're always looking at things with faith. You're always looking at and for the positive. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul said, by example, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at your, at your care of me hath flourished again wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunities that y'all been able to pick up again on offering me support and helping me. He said, whereas there was a time when you lacked opportunity. He said, not that I speak in respect of one. He said, y'all been able to help me lately. He said, but it's not because I've been in a real bad place. He said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, Therewith to be content. Talking about spiritually minded. Talking about walking in a spiritual mindset. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know, I know how to be broke and I know how to do well. Everywhere and in all things. Listen, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He ends with this statement, I can do all things through Christ, 
which strengtheneth me. I'm talking today about breaking free of carnal thinking. I'm talking today about walking in a spiritual mindset, letting the Word of God and the will of God dominate our thoughts, dominate our thinking, looking what is God's will, that we not be always looking for a demon behind every tree. And I'm going to tell you something. These people that want to act like Christians are supposed to know everything. You know, we know, oh, uh, all these uh, uh, needles they're trying to give us for COVID. Well, that's just a big conspiracy. We know, we know this is just a big conspiracy. Idiot. I'll tell you something. There's a reason God doesn't tell us everything before it happens. There's a reason God doesn't tell us the end from the beginning. Because, honey, we couldn't handle it. We couldn't wait for the end. We'd be doing everything in our power to rest things. We'd be doing everything in our power to make things happen today that God doesn't mean to happen for another century. Am I telling the truth? Amen. There's a reason why God doesn't tell us everything. And all these Christians running around in our world today, terrified, living in fear, letting politicians manipulate them using fear and angst and negativity and complaints and accusations. They're carnal everyone because the spiritually minded person is looking at Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, and I tell the truth, think on these things. So the Lord said, no, no, as a child of God, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, then you need to always be looking at the positive. You always have to look at every circumstance, every situation through the eyes of faith. Running around screaming that the devil's winning the race and the devil's winning the war because the horse, blah, 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 blah. honey, got news for you. That is not a spiritual mind, that is a carnal mind. And I'm here to tell you today, God wants us to break free of carnal thinking. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? I want